moderated by Brittany Holbush, who is um, the entrepreneur involved with the development of Grazing School of the West. Um, Melissa um, will be, um, this is the time for um, Christian, Melissa, um, Paige, Lynn, and Jared to come up, and I will hand it over to Brittany Colbush, who you saw in the film. All the actors in the film are live. <laughs> I'm a shortstop. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here with my Fiber Shed community. Uh, I feel like I grew up with this community here, and it's uh, fantastic to be here with a whole bunch of other young grazers. All right. Can we take it to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, we're here to talk today about prescriptive grazing. Earlier today we talked about prescriptive burning and they actually go very well hand in hand. Prescriptive grazing is known uh, as many other things. We'll talk a little bit about that. You may have heard of uh, uh, contract grazing, adaptive management grazing. Um, there's several. And we're going to talk to four folks today who are all involved in prescriptive grazing in some form or another, having to do with fire hazard reduction or integrated crop systems. Next slide. Here we go. Adaptive managed grazing, targeted grazing, contract grazing, prescribed herbivory. My favorite one is the last one. Uh, if you hear these things, these are all different types of uh, titles and labels for a type of managed grazing that is working to achieve uh, an ecological goal that also includes, uh, in many cases, the fire hazard reduction piece. This is a very careful and very mindfully managed, uh, managed operation with sheep, goats, and sometimes uh, other wonderful ungulates. All right, next one, please. As uh, we just heard, which was really exciting, I, I always get jazzed when I hear really amazing, incredible women just rule it at uh, important information. Um, integrated crop and livestock systems. Uh, there's the, the Irwin's sheep grazing in those vineyards. Next one. Fire hazard abatement or fuel load reduction. Here's an example of uh, an operation of sheep that were used, sheep and goats, I believe, used to uh, reduce that vegetation. Uh, you can see one acre to two acres a day being reduced on that slope of 45 degrees. Uh, think about folks with weed whippers. These uh, animals do a really good job. All right, next one. Um, like Rebecca said, my background, I started my career as a, a grazing gal on the ground. And now I'm here as an advocate and an educator and an entrepreneur to help grow the next generation of grazers. Uh, last year, Guido Frassini and I got to go to Europe to investigate the shepherding schools in Spain and France to learn how they're uh, training their next generation of grazers. And it's our effort now to adapt uh, models that we learned from out there to bring it here. We are calling it the Grazing School of the West, which you've already heard about today. More, more information to come on that. All right, let's um, move ahead. Clicker. Great. So we're going to just move ahead to uh, questions, and we're going to ask all the panelists to introduce themselves uh, prior to um, prior to the uh, uh, the questions that they're going to answer. And you folks might have uh, the questions right there. There you go. Melissa? Let's see, does this work? OK. My name is Melissa Trigilgis, and my husband and myself and our three, um, well, four daughters are um, managing 95 acres of leased pasture in um, Placerville, California. We're actually really between Placerville and Auburn. Um, and we are very lucky and in a, just kind of an interesting situation that we lease our land from a um, conservancy, a land conservancy, and we're the first um, first folks to be working with them doing um, adaptive grazing. Um, they have some ranchers that they work with that do very conventional grazing, 
and we're kind of the, we get to be their guinea pigs in a way um, and learn with them how we can use animals to improve the land that we're, we're working with. So the primary um, part of our farm is a small scale localized dairy. Um, and then along with that we have about, we have about 16 dairy cows and probably 63 sheep um, and the sheep are, um, they're not the economic foundation of the farm, but they're very complementary to the cows and how they graze. Um, we can graze them in areas that we can't graze the dairy cows. Uh, we do also raise some non-ruminants. We have pigs that we'll have seasonally, um, as well as laying hens that we have year-round. But really the focus of our operation is the grazing animals. Um, and we're... We're in an area that was traditionally managed by Nisanon, uh, native Californians, and it has been uh, that that aspect of the land has been the the human management is uh, missing, and so it's been really exciting to learn how we can work with our animals and try to um, bring back that that human management in a way that encourages ecosystem diversity. Um, Alright, let's see if I can, not oh, wrong way. So um, part of that is we are trying to use as many different kinds of animals as we can to increase um, plant diversity by, you know, we are grazing heifers. We can't necessarily graze our dairy cows with our sheep all the time, but we can graze heifers with the sheep and it's really awesome to see them working together. They like to eat different things. They graze in different ways. They don't share parasites. Um, so it's kind of exciting to, um, to be able to integrate two species or more. Um, and let's see. We also are trying to be, um, be able to produce livestock in a way that is not going to harm but actually benefit the native animals. So we're using livestock guardian dogs. Um, we're, we don't do any kind of lethal predator control. We, um, we actually really enjoy seeing predators on our land. <laughs> the dogs are very effective. Um, and we've seen bobcats, mountain lion, and bear on the property and we've never lost a sheep because of our dogs. But part of what we do, we do a little bit of fuel load reduction just for our own personal uh, security um, or in the areas around our house on property. And we've done a little bit for neighbors. And we also, um, we, we plan for a lot of different things. We want to be able to work with the conservancy and show them that grazing can benefit the land and it really can benefit the biodiversity of the plant species and the wildlife. Um, and we also, know that a lot of our neighbors are afraid of fire and so we can selectively manage certain areas for decreased fuel load um, moreover uh, than we, you know we still want to see more diversity in those areas but it's a tool that we can uh, grazing is a tool we can adapt to both fuel load reduction and to increasing um, ecosystem diversity so I think that's I think you, you actually just answered uh, one of our first que questions is, how do you integrate livestock into your larger farming system? And uh, I think you made a good point in choosing the class of animals that you're working together and that, that flirt, uh, the heifer and the, the sheep. Are there any management issues when you think about um, integrating those, the, the livestock and the mixed species together? Um, well, a big thing for us is the dogs, actually, because the sheep, you know, if a sheep headbutts the dog, it's not going to be a big deal, and our dogs tend to be pretty submissive towards the sheep, but with the cows, um, they're a lot more aggressive. They're, you know, as moms, they're defending cows from coyotes um, occasionally, and we've never lost a calf to a coyote, so I guess they do a pretty, or to any predator, so we we uh, kind of want that, but we can't integrate the adult cows in with the, the sheep and the dogs necessarily yet. We haven't figured out how to do that safely because we don't want our dogs to get smashed by, by our cows. Um, <laughs> it's a 
big learning curve yes. when you add uh, different species together. Yeah. I'm but sure we can, you. we can have the heifers in there. They're small enough. Um, they haven't quite connected the dog coyote thing. Um, and they, they've so far been really nice to run with the sheep. Thank you. It's good to learn about your operation. Christian, I'm going to pass it over to you if you want to give us about a two, three minute introduction to what you're up to, and, uh, and then I'll ask you the same thing about how you operate in farming systems and what are your primary goals in integrating these animals into those systems. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be in the room. There's like a kind of like, I feel like a heat from all the like knowledge and passion that's in the room. It's kind of psychedelic, but I'm very, <laughs> very honored to be here. I think, yeah, I think that's it. I might need a doctor. But yeah, uh, I, this is definitely the moral of the story for me, and um, I don't know if I'll have time to get into it, but if anybody has an answer to this question just for them, personally, I'd love for you to, I'd love to talk about it with you. Um, so I'll just try to run through quickly um, what my work in this field has been. So this is the, this is the grasslands um, that, that I inhabit. And uh, so for me, in my effort to, to find that relationship, I want it to be something where I'm uh, nurturing and improving the grasslands, and the grasslands is nurturing and improving me, and, and offer that same, offer uh, an avenue to that same relationship for my wider community. And my community is in the Cape Hay Valley, and, and some of my community's here today, Sally Fox, um, for starters. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more arid um, climate than than um, the surroundings of here, and it's largely non-native climate um, for landscape uh, in terms of the grasses there. So it's a good it's a good thing to keep in mind when you're talking about like restoration agriculture. So um, my role in this, I don't think of myself as as a researcher. I'm constantly like, researching, um, is to um, develop a reproducible model which can work outside of the private property and nature control paradigm to pursue ecological goals well economically self-sufficient. And so a lot of that is to say, I'm, I'm so glad that, Dr. that Professor Budan could speak before me because it is so much I can't get into. And when I hear her speak, it's like hearing my heart speak in like an eloquent French. <laughs> so, so basically, I, this is my role is to say, how can we apply this knowledge and get it going? Because I look at my landscape and, um, I guess I'll go too forward. I look at my landscape and I see largely undergrazing, and I see some overgrazing, and I see some very, very small pockets of, of uh, managed grazing. And I just, I, so um, my whole aim is to say, how can we bring this managed grazing to the whole landscape? And the, um, part of the parameters I operate under are try to move the, move the flock of sheep every one to three days and not return to the same piece of land for at least six months. So that's real for any of you who are landowners and maybe managing animals, that's kind of a, a hard thing to manage on a small piece of land. And so that's why it seems really crucial to me to work outside the private property paradigm. And so I started by offering a regenerative grazing service to my grasslands community so that um, each of those pieces of land that uh, are kind of in the collective um, can benefit from the grazing uh, and allow, allow those ecological goals to go hand in hand with the economic goals. What's the ratio of sheep to acres? Uh, I'm just thinking about how hard the sheep fence is to move every three days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thinking like, perimeter is. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we, yeah, we can get into it. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I'm pretty much operating all unused land. The whole idea is to give landowners an alternative to mowing or disking in their land and a way, like I said, to develop that relationship with the grasslands. I think I'm probably already out of time. Oh, you're but, good. You're good. These are the ecological goals that I pursue. Um, it's all about, and um, kind of in tandem with what Professor Godin was saying, I view kind of the whole accomplishment as possible through using grazing to emphasize and propagate perennial grasses that are uh, in the native seed bank. And I think that that's going to do so, so much more because it's going to be able to draw down carbon and nutrients and sugars and water down into the soil profile as you're seeing comparing annuals. Uh, this is a, comp uh, 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 a comparison between annual and perennial varieties of wheat um, by drawing those things so much farther deeper down into the soil. Um, so that's really what I see as, as the work to be done. And that's, uh, I want, just wanted to share with you, this is kind of what it might look like day to day. Um, 
<laughs> that's me. Um, and so that's that's part of the whole mind state is it's just viewing even even a very arid landscape as the means of production and viewing just to kind of drive past that some I would deal with a lot of landowners who say I don't really care about drawing down carbon, but if you're going to save me a mowing, that's great. And I, and uh, I deal with um, and so through the management we're able to take this and turn it to that. And so I think. Um, I'm just trying to always inhabit the mindset of a perennial grass and say, how can I take this and turn it into a fertilized mulch for those perennial grasses and help them outcompete the annuals, which is a whole other story. Um, and really what makes me the happiest is when I start seeing these native perennials coming back to the landscape. There's a, a, a steep uh, purple needle grass on the left and then a California fescue on the right. And these are just, I don't know how many people in the room, maybe some hands have tried to um, have tried to seed perennial grasses and, and care for them, and maybe if you want to say like how it went for you. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of this. And so these are plants that I haven't watered or seeded, but have just um, brought back together their inherent indigenous relationship with herbivores. Um, and this is Pam, and Pam's one of the favorite uh, landowners I work with, and I've been grazing Pam's orchard for a few years, and um, that's, those are the photos from Pam's property about the, the uh, grasses coming back. and. Um, uh, basically, Pam used to get the orchard mowed and by another farmer, and then she saw these grasses coming back. And so when the farmer came time to mow this year, she said, I don't want you to mow it. He said, this is your fire safety plan. And she said, no, these grasses are my fire safety plan. Which, uh, and that's just some of the land there. And so just to say, it turned out to be a very non-theoretical question. I took these photos uh, July of this year. Um, so thanks very much for your time. Two questions for you and the integrated crop, a livestock crop system folks. How do you self-identify in the realm of grazing with livestock? I hear a lot of us calling ourselves different things. New pastoralist, grazier, farmer, <laughs> contract grazer. How do you self-identify? Because I, I've screwed that one up and you can really tick someone off if you call them the wrong thing. How do you self-identify in this world? Yeah, yeah I, I always really clearly market myself as, a, as offering a regenerative grazing service because um, you get into a, a lot of, uh, there's been some times where I've turned down paid grazing contracts because people want me to come on their property and denude it and leave bare soil. And I said, I don't want to do that, you know, so marketing myself as a regenerative, uh, as offering a regenerative grazing service helps me clarify that with people and um, helps start that conversation about perennial grasses and that relationship with our grasslands. I'm not sure how we identify ourselves. Um, I kind of don't like to label myself as anything, but I guess first and foremost, just dairymen and shepherds, or at least trying to be. We're first generation, so sometimes it feels like our it's a steep learning curve, and it's kind of um, like I'm afraid to officially label myself as that um, because I don't have uh, any kind of generational background. Um, and my husband doesn't either. But I guess grass farmer. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. That's great. Um, that, that answered my next question is, are you a first generation agrarian? Yeah. Both of you. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. And are you under 65 years old? Yes. <laughs> so we're pulling the average age of a farmer down right here in the United States. Good work. First, first generation agrarians. All right. Thank you so much. You've already heard uh, from this good guy, Jared. Um, Jared, we're going to ask you uh, the first. Uh, oh, actually, we're going to jump to Paige. Pardon. Jared, can you pass it over to Paige? Thank you. And don't worry, you sound eloquent. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to get over to our uh, fire grazing folks. Um, Paige Lynn, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, two to three minutes, and then I'll ask the first question about uh, what you do. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Fiber Shed, for having me do this today. Um, I had no idea what to expect, and this is my first panel, so now that I know what to expect. Um, this, uh, I guess a little bit about me, they've 
Brittany did a great job of describing what it is that we do, and Christian has a great reason why we do the things that we do. Um, I did not, I had no previous experience grazing the land or being a land steward. I um, call myself a contract grazer. I do some small scale contract grazing um, with my own herd of goats, but most of my grazing work is done with sweetgrass grazing and Aaron Gilliam. That's been about two years now, two years this month I've been working with them. Um, uh, prior to that, I really focused on reconnecting people to animals. I grew up on a small horse ranch on the outside of the East Bay. Um, we had a variety of farm animals, and it was a really fulfilling and satisfying life to bring on people of all age groups and introduce them to how they could be in relationship with other species respectfully. We felt like there was a um, lot of hope and social progress to be made if we could create those connections. Um, but after college, I ran off to the Sierras and um, corral bossed as a, at a horse and mule pack station for a couple of years. Um, and in the four years that I did that, I, I realized that the connection to animals, while it was important, our connection to the land and taking responsibility for it um, was also extremely important. So I returned to school and studied sustainable agriculture and natural resource management, actually at the JC in Santa Rosa. Um, and through the natural resource pro uh, management program, I was able to come in contact with Erin Gilliam of Sweetgrass Grazing. Um, for those of you that don't know Erin, he's um, a true land steward, highly focused on it, just every aspect of what we do. And his top priority is really increasing soil health and biodiversity on our landscapes in a hope to increase our overall resilience. Um, it's a service that we offer, um, but it's also just our his passion and our priority um, as contract grazers. We also offer vegetation management services, so we've grazed vineyards, um, cover crop in orchard and on uh, vegetable farms, um, and then just basic vegetation management on small small scale to large properties. Eighty to about three hundred acres is, is the kind of average for our um, seasonal contracts. And then fuel reduction, I'll focus on a little bit more in depth since that's kind of the, the big topic today. Um, I would break down our fuel management services or ser fuel management goals into two categories, and that's short term and long term. And short term being seasonal fuel reduction, you can see on the left, the sheep went into that paddock in the evening, they left in the morning in the gray area that you can't, you can't really see because it was an evening photo, but there's um, bull milk and Italian thistle that are about five and a half, five to six feet tall um, along that uh, creek bank that needs more restoration. And the next day, all of it was leveled so that it wasn't a large ladder fuel or something with a lot of air in it that would burn quickly and fast across the landscape. Um, but we brought it all down and then moved them quickly off of that area in order to keep the soil covered so that we weren't leaving bare soil exposed. And then the bottom area, you can see the same um, uh, process of uh, trampling down that tall vegetation into something that would cover the soil, become part of the soil, um, and reduce the actual field load on the landscape. And then the other type of goal, and those short-term goals are often why we get our contracts. It's often why people call us. They want to get rid of their seasonal fuel. They want to make their landscape fireproof for a minute. Um, and then once we enter <laughs> once we enter those contracts, we're really able to start a conversation, a relationship with those people and develop an educational opportunity around what it means to have a resilient landscape. And it allows us, it's been an incredible opportunity to me to see Aaron interact with people in the way that he does and teach them things and also be able to compromise and hear their side and not, um, uh, not forget that it's a fearful place that people come from. So it's really important to hear them out um, and then work with them through that process of learning. So once, we able to, once we're able to develop those relationships, um, or even now people do call us for with this long-term goal in mind and say, can we start a five or 10 year contract? And um, which is pretty impressive. It's the development of resilient landscapes. So we take that into consideration in, in throughout our entire contract and our daily movement across the land. Um, and we decide whether or not we're gonna use high density impact for that reason, short term, long term, you know, short term being a couple of hours in one space versus a couple of days in one space. Um, how we move across slopes in order to not, to not um, influence or uh, cause erosion and 
at targeting a certain invasive species. You can see the goats love to take, or the sheep and the goats love to take the seed heads off of the yellow star thistle, but timing that correctly so that we're having that positive influence that we're hoping for. Um, and then the picture on the right is actually our smallest contract, which is a nine acre project in Larkspur. And this is, this was the project that really made me realize just how much Aaron was a true land steward that we were able to go in with our sheep, which you can't actually see them that well, but, um, and remove that understory of the forest and then follow through by helping them lift the branches of, of um, some of the invasive species that, or some of the trees that were there and go in and help lock down invasive species that ha they hadn't gotten. So it's a really um, intricate system and I feel honored to be part of it. And uh, I think, yeah. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Would you like to tell us a little more about yourself or just skip all the stuff we know? <laughs> uh, I'll try not to tell the same jokes. Um, sorry for folks that uh, saw me talk in the morning. Um, uh, some similar slides, some similar subjects. Um, obviously talking about fire again, but there is a grazing component. And I will just say that uh, the way I not only came into fire, but then just land stewardship was my love of uh, grasslands and oak savanna. And uh, Claire, my partner, who's here, um, often gives me hell for all the, I'm like, oh my god, look at that bunch of grass. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. like, it's grass. Uh, um, so um, I'm just going to start this story, uh, like the last story, with another firestorm. Uh, this one, the more recent, um, Tubbs Nuns Fire of uh, 2017. Um, don't need to go into detail on that, but it motivated people, and I mentioned this earlier, but um, especially in my hometown, to try to do something, and so um, we started clearing brush um, as a neighborhood on collective land, a lot of it East Bay mud land, where their uh, management system is to do nothing. Um, <laughs> or brush busting, um, and that photo will come back more. This is French broom being pulled, which um, is a major problem in the East Bay, also in the North Bay. It is, yeah. Uh, you, can't, you can't get rid of it. It's very hard to get rid of. I, I can answer some thoughts on that, but it's, it takes diligence for sure. Uh, uh, I showed this slide earlier, but that's French broom on the left. This is a shaded fuel break. Uh, so we started a community goat herd to try to manage some of these open space areas. Um, Lots of poison oak that we're all getting, and uh, lots of fence putting up. Uh, most of these part, most of these neighbors um, are completely new to uh, husbandry. We have um, myself. I've worked on some ranches here and there, um, and um, the woman who donated the goats, um, she obviously has some husbandry background. But otherwise, we took a grant to buy electric fencing. Um, and moved it around the community amongst the houses. So we're actually unable, or we are able to get away from using trailers, which was nice. It's a very small area. This is a community of about, say, 350 people. Barely seen on slides here. Um, so yeah, more prescribed herbivory. That's eight foot tall, uh, old growth poison oak. <laughs> not protected by CEQA. Um, <laughs> Mobile Goat Strike Force. Um, so this spot, I thought I had it before and after, but maybe I don't. But that one earlier uh, photo, I don't, no I don't, um, of the community uh, cutting brush. This is actually in the same area. It's right by the road. Um, definitely a lot of bare soil, um, uh, but being that we're trying to create a fire break, there's some usefulness in that. And then we've come back afterwards and spread some wood chips in these areas. This is also, by the way, obviously very small scale. Um, and so what we're trying to do at this point is take this to the North Bay and by combining the idea of the Prescribed Burn Association that Lenya was speaking about and I had mentioned earlier um, with some of these other tools that might be more appropriate in certain neighborhoods, uh, creating what we're calling the Good Fire Alliance. Uh, find us on Facebook. And um, um, by doing that, we're opening the toolbox to everything that's possible. Um, there was some good conversation today about well, what would it look like for a community to hire a full-time uh, uh, community organizer and uh, herd uh, 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 grazer, yeah, herder, herder. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, some interesting stuff going on there. And if you are interested in the Good Fire Alliance, or just in the work that Audubon Canyon Ranch is doing, that I'm doing with the Fire Forward program, this is my email. Um, and then also, I, I didn't really even talk about Audubon Canyon Ranch. We're using cattle uh, just to manage our grasslands along with fire. Um, but that's all another subject. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. I'm, going to, um, I'm going to kind of get straight to some questions because we are tight on our time. Um, well, first off, how do you self-identify as a grazer, land steward, shepherd, herder, whatever it might be? And are you first-gen or multi-generation uh, agrarian? Yeah, not first Gen at all, or for very much so first gen, not multi generational at all. Um, grazer, shepherd, lazy. you're not limited. You can you can go. Yeah, you can go big. All of them. It's an honor to control any of them. Yeah. <laughs> shepherd. I think shepherd. I like that. One. Here, here. Year round. Awesome. And Jared. Uh, well, my pin here says prescribed fire specialist, but was actually when I first made this, it said prescribed file specialist. <laughs> <laughs> PDFs, X files, <laughs> um, but uh, um, my mom rented a house on. Uh, this rancher's land in Canyon, that's how we ended up there. And um, he had uh, more renters than, than uh, livestock, so I jokingly said that he raised renters. And we were one of those renters. And so, but he became a surrogate grandfather for me and uh, uh, ended up you know, fixing fence and things like that and uh, learning to ride from him. And, um, and then working on the neighbor's ranch too. And uh, so I jokingly say that I'm a half generation rancher. <laughs> so, but, um, um, and then, yeah, that's the that. Fair enough. Well, I, I asked all of these uh, things to y'all because everybody here is a first generation, whatever they just described themselves as. I'll call them first gen agrarians or grazers here in prescriptive grazing, which we've identified is a strategy that can be uh, utilized as an alternative to chemical, chemicals and fossil fuel uh, machinery to reduce fire hazard. Uh, we've learned a lot about the tool of prescribed uh, burning. Prescribed grazing in tandem makes for a beautiful combo. Uh, also, we wanted I wanted to point out the seasonality aspect. How cool is the on-season and off-season for grazers when you have a, a couple different op options of being in the vineyards or under the orchards when in the winter time when you are not doing fire grazing jobs. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a stacked model for grazing enterprises. Pretty awesome. So um, I wanted to hop along to uh, another question for our integrative livestock and cross, crop system pals. Um, so in my experience working in contract grazing with sheep and goats, um, year in and year out, usually it, uh, it's been in public parks and I only get to go there, or I've gotten to go there only one time a year. And I've seen slowly but surely small shifts and changes every year. Sometimes with private landowners, they want to see an outcome. Well, hey, it grew back. It did, you know, that, that same star thistle grew back. But uh, in educating as grazers, because we wear a lot of hats, um, helping to describe how when soil composition changes, when we improve the integrity and health of the soil, we're improving all of the wonderful things such as mineral cycles, water retention, all of these groovy things, we're able to then set the stage for desirable uh, plants and forbs to grow. Have you seen any ecological shifts in any of the places that you've grazed uh, over a period of time? We have shades, yes. <laughs> um, we've only been leasing the property we're on for about it's been like three and a half years now. Um, but even just in that time, which I feel like is fairly short to expect to see a lot of change, um, we went from fields, there had been actually some um, planned burns there. They had, I think, two years of burning and no grazing afterwards. And I don't know, I'm not sure exactly how it worked. There were a lot of um, 
bulldozer lines in our pastures that we at least know and um, when we got there it was a lot of medusa head and star thistle so i don't know if they timed it very well for what they were hoping for but um we've been able to see um really a pretty incredible reduction in medusa head and an increase of more beneficial species not all of them are well a lot of them are not native we're not seeing the perennials that we want to see everywhere yet but we are seeing a little bit of um, return of perennials we're seeing a, a little bit of natives coming back um, annual natives um, actually it's not true I, this year was um, the first time I've seen some baby oak trees in areas that we have been grazing um, I've been waiting for it and hoping that it would happen and we've um, got a couple spots where we have um, new oak trees coming up which is exciting but um, mostly we're just seeing that increase in diversity so it'll go from being a field of like waist high star thistle when we got there which is not very fun to work with to um, starting to see some return of, of species that are not as painful um, and uh, we have had a I don't know, it, it's, it's a trade-off because we found for the Medusa head in particular, the way that we need to hit it to be able to get that diversity to return um, really is intense um, and kind of expensive to manage for in the long term. So we are trying to hit different areas of the property that need it um, with that particular super high impact um, each year because we can't do all of it in one year but we've we've been able to see like some native wildflowers returning and um, better grasses and clovers so it's exciting so we're gonna have to kind of hyper speed or, or, or do a 1.5 speed voice cool yeah, I, can do that. I think I just had two thoughts on that one is one positive change I love seeing is um, is uh, star thistle, yellow star thistle seed into grasses through grazing management alone. It's something I love seeing. And the other thing, in the in the landscape, the thing that encourages me the most is people starting to care about the grasses we didn't care before. And they're creatures in the landscape, and they're going to have a huge impact. So I love starting those conversations. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to two stories real quick. Uh, one is on the Swanton Pacific Ranch, which. Um, uh, it's right on the coast, just north of Davenport. Um, uh, in 10 years of grazing there, and I worked there for a bit, um, uh, you can see in the furrows that used to be plowed, which essentially is all invasives after the plow, right? Um, for artichokes, they stopped doing that and started doing rotational grazing entirely. And now you're seeing Danthonia californica, which has uh, been referred to as the champagne of California grasses, um, <laughs> showing up all in the furrows. It's really rather lovely. And I think while, of course, you can't completely uh, place credit or blame on the cattle, of course, it is definitely a major component because it's, it's the, really the major impact that spot is seeing. And on the opposite side of it is the McCosco Ranch in my hometown. It's 850 acres and was bought by a, a development company for mitigation reasons, got completely closed off from, from grazing. And um, I've watched that landscape just completely change for the worse. Um, from everything from brush coming in to harding grass taking over whole massive draw, you know, 100 acre draws. Um, I haven't seen wildflowers out there in any profusion, even after big rain years. Um, so there's a, a very obvious connection in my mind between the grazing and not grazing, just my home area. Thank you. Paige, you want to answer that one really quickly? I mean, some of the same stuff. I think I've seen a huge decrease in the yellow star thistle population on the properties that that's what we're targeting and a dramatic increase in biodiversity this season on the properties that we've been managing for three years or more and, and you know one of them before we even got there the property manager was telling us like you've got to see how much more diversity there is so it's really cool just to speak to what Christian said it's cool to see other people um, or other animals on the landscape noticing the change and the increase in health and diversity. Awesome. Something I wanted to point out when listening to y'all, uh, I've heard, you know, some folks being really allergic out there to grazing. Grazing is bad, cows are bad, sheep and goats are bad, grazing has destroyed the West. Well, I have to argue that I think that it's 
the animals are not inherently bad. I think what we need to, to understand is that as our world and our environment is changing, the way in which we manage our animals, the way in which we are part of our communities, the way in which we approach stewardship uh, absolutely has uh, everything to do with what, how we impact uh, the landscapes and the communities that we're a part of. So uh, I think bringing it back to prescriptive grazing, we are surgically grazing, not just on the land with the animals, but we're also educators and participating with the decision makers on the land, be it public or private. So I want to applaud all of these grazers here who are part of this prescriptive grazing, this surgical, mindful, big heart, uh, big hearted approach to taking care of animals on the land. Um, the last question I want to uh, kind of hit off with, and it has to be really quick, and I think I would like to ask you, Paige Lynn, what do you think the biggest opportunity is to grow more grazers? And what is the biggest challenge and how can we as a community support uh, getting more folks like you and I and everybody else up here, first generation agrarians out there on the land being stewards, public servants, and uh, friends of sheep, goats, and cows, and other fiber animals. <laughs> I think collaborating as, within our communities to increase educational opportunities. Um, so I'm inclined to say grazing school of the West. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good idea. I just lined that one up, didn't I? <laughs> um, yeah, really but coming together to, to increase educational opportunities and create those connections, um, whether it's people with an other animals or um, animals on the land or all of it, and connecting with landowners and land managers and just collaborate and get the opportunity increase those opportunities thank you every every individual here represents a different model of how an operation or a business or a family farm can integrate prescriptive grazing to achieve ecological goals as well as public safety goals and fire hazard reduction there are awesome models out there and we have to continue to innovate how we can have viable livelihoods, have a next generation interested and intrigued into getting into this work. And so um, with FiberShed and the support of wonderful folks within our community and elsewhere in the West, uh, we're working to create a vocational training program to help support viable livelihoods like all of these folks up here so we can continue to grow grazers so we can see more animals being managed mindfully on the landscape to create fire hazard community driven fire hazard uh, abatement projects so we can really be empowered and emboldened with our neighborhoods to create strategies that are alternatives to or additions to what we already have out there we need to manage our vegetation and we need to do it together and I invite everybody here to, to really think about how they can get involved to initiate community-driven uh, prescriptive grazing projects within your neighborhoods. And the, the thing that makes uh, me all juiced up is if we could get neighborhoods to all come together to support a community-supported herd, uh, reduce the, the cost of transportation, and have the running of the goats uh, maybe <laughs> a few times a year and everybody is involved in herding those animals from one place to another so we can ditch trucks and we can all really be a part of active management of our landscapes while supporting new livelihoods in regenerative agriculture. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this community and I'm so grateful to all y'all out there as leaders, as next generation grazers. Let's grow some grazers. Please support the Grazing School of the West and hop online and figure out how to do that. Thank you so much. <laughs>